Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Kathleen Biggins and I am the president and founder of Sea Change Conversations. Since 2014, our team has been pulling people together to educate them on the science and implications of climate change. Today, we continue those efforts with our new solution series. We plan to bring you interviews with experts who can explain the new innovative ideas, new products, processes, policies, even new science that give us hope that we can address this challenge. Today, we are going to focus on nuclear fusion, the power of the stars that humans are recreating right here on the planet. For many, it promises to be the holy grail because it could offer limitless, carbon-free, clean energy for a wide range of applications from electricity to manufacturing, even transportation. But others call it a pipe dream because after 70 years of fairly intensive research and investment, it remains slightly out of reach. So what is it? The Holy Grail or a pipe dream? Is fusion part of the answer to this challenge? How quickly could it come on board and how expensive would it be? How does it compare to other solutions we are pursuing? To help us answer these and other questions, we've invited a world-renowned expert on fusion energy, Sir Steve Cowley. Steve is the director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab for Fusion Energy. Earlier, he was the chief executive officer of the United Kingdom's Atomic Energy Authority. And in 2018, Steve was knighted by the Queen of England for his work in the area of fusion. Steve, thank you for joining us. It is such a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. So Steve, set the table for us. Explain to us what nuclear fusion is and how it is different from nuclear energy we currently use. So nuclear fusion is what stars do. It joins um, small atoms, the nuclei, the atoms together to make larger ones. And what's different about this is we have the fuel for it on Earth to power the planet for billions of years in seawater. And it, if we can make it work in a commercial way, it has no waste um, that we have to worry about. It makes helium um, and in very small quantities. Uh, the third reason, it's very safe. It is literally unleashing the power of the stars for our electricity grids to power our homes, to, to move our cargo. It sounds almost too good to be true. Well, you know, <laughs> it's sort of the perfect way to make energy, um, except one thing. You have to create the conditions in the middle of the star. And that means it has to be incredibly hot, hundreds of millions of degrees, and you have to hold it while it's very hot, while it, it does this reaction, and make that little star on Earth. We've done it. We've done it in, a, in science labs and we've successfully created those conditions, but we've got quite a way to go before it's commercially viable. And how does it compare with other so-called solutions to the climate crisis, such as wind and solar energy, or even the emerging battery storage sector? How does it compare? How does it work with or compete? Well, I don't think any of this is competing in the sense that we have to do everything we can to wean ourselves of fossil fuels. And this is one of the tools that we need to be able to, to put in place. But the key thing that fusion can do that wind and solar can't do is that it can generate electricity when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, and um, that's going to be very important. We see renewables right now sometimes producing huge amounts of energy and powering almost everything that we need. But a couple of years back in Britain, December was a month, if you've ever been December in Britain, there was no sun, obviously, <laughs> um, and the wind didn't blow for the whole of December. There's no way you can store energy for that time of the, uh, over that length of period in any of the ways we know right now. And, and so, of course, we had to burn lots of fossil fuels during, uh, during December. We've got to replace that. We've got to change that situation. And fusion could do that. That's interesting you say that because I think some of the detractors from fusion say 
we have these technologies in hand. We have wind, we have solar, we have emerging batteries that are coming down in cost. Shouldn't we be spending our investment there because we know we can achieve it versus on fusion, which holds so much promise, yet still is somewhat far off and may not come online quickly enough to help us address this? Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, we do have to, it's all hands on deck to get as much renewables um, online as fast as possible. But that gap that you have from intermittency um, is a major issue if you want to go to net zero. Mm -hmm. If you want to reduce our emissions by 50%, then renewables will get us there. And that's helpful. But we need to get to net zero. And that means having energy when we need it as cheaply as we need it. Now, developing fusion may cost of ten, us tens of billions of dollars. But in a world energy market that's seven trillion, tens of billions ain't much money, <laughs> right? And we should do it, right? We should put that option on the table and see how it works its way into the market. The market will find its niche, its niche when it's, when it's there. So you've talked about the fact that it's clean. You've talked about the fact that it could power us for the rest of our time that this earth still exists. What are the downsides? What do you think are the complications in moving forward? Well, there's really only one downside, and that is that it's really difficult to do. This business that you have to have be able to contain the fuel at these immense temperatures means that we've had to invent technologies that there is no natural analog for. There are very few technologies in which there's no natural analog. The airplane has the bird. Right. right? The, you know, the fire, well, there were natural fires, right? Um, in nuclear fusion, the natural analog is a star, right? Imagine trying to make a star on Earth. That's exactly what we're trying to do, right? right. Um, so the, the problem with fusion, there are no problems if we can make it work. There are only problems making it work. What are the breakthroughs that are enabling us to actually think it is within our reach, within time, to help us address climate change? So um, I think one of the things, let, let's look at the climate change issue on this one, which is, of course, renewable energy is coming down in cost, and it's going to play a big part in our future net zero energy system. But the problem, obviously, with renewables is that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind does not always blow, um, and storing energy for long periods of time is very hard. So we need, alongside renewables, what the experts are now calling firm energy, which is something you can switch on when you need it, and you switch off when you don't need it, and will always be there. Um, and fusion is probably the perfect solution to that problem. So there is a growing awareness that we need to accelerate the delivery of fusion. We've done a lot of the science. We, here at Princeton in 1994, quite a long time ago now, um, we actually created 10 million watts of fusion power in a machine here at Princeton. It was the world record at the time. And in the center of that machine, we were holding the fusion fuel in a cage of magnetic field at temperatures around 300 million degrees. And we were holding it steady and it was, everything was working. That's not commercial energy. That's a science experiment. And what we have to do now is take what is a scientific possibility and turn it into what's a commercial possibility. So it sounds like if we bear down and do the investment and continue to explore the science and continue to scale it, it could indeed be part of the solution as we move towards the middle of the century. When do you actually see it coming onto the grid? What's possible? So, you know, that depends, of course, on investment levels. Um, just on the, let's see, the 22nd of March, we had a summit in the White House. And White House leadership on this is, has taken a huge step forward. And I think there are several reasons for this. Um, first of all is that realization that we need to find another way to fill the gaps, yeah. firm energy. The second is I think that um, there has been huge private sector investment. In the last two years approaching $4 billion in investment in 
fusion startup companies. Those startup companies are taking what we in the science community have been producing and starting to say, okay, how do we engineer this as a, as a commercial source? And at the summit, the Secretary of Energy, uh, um, Secretary Grandholm, uh, said, let's aim for a decadal timescale in delivering fusion. Now, decadal, they didn't say decade, uh, which I think means that uh, many of us feel that it'd be hard to get you know, net, energy, net electricity production in a decade. Um, but the National Academy has said towards the end of the 2030s, first electricity from this source, which means by the middle of the century, we may actually be producing commercial objects that people will buy. Um, not as quick as I'd like. I mean, we, we need it now. Um, but I think that, you know, it's an extraordinary technology. How do you create a the, take the fuel to 200 million degrees, which is sort of the right temperature, t t optimum temperature for this to happen at? 200 million degrees, hold it, make sure that it, it exhausts properly, convert that energy into electricity. These are all things that are sort of ahead of us now. Um, and I, I'm really pleased that the White House has stepped forward to sort of push this forward and say, we want to deliver on this time scale. Um, and I'm pleased to see <coughs> commercial companies coming forward to put investment into it. But there's probably three or four things in which we're looking for young people to come in and innovate so that that part of the problem works better. We have a solution for almost everything in that step, but some of our solutions are a little less than what you might call optimum. If we come to market and it, it's not at a price that people want to pay for their energy, mm -hmm. then it won't be successful. So you gave us a lot of information there. Um, first, let's tell our audiences what the other base load energy uh, systems are that we currently use and that fusion would potentially be replacing, right. which would be what, coal, natural gas, nuclear so, as we know it. <coughs> so base load at the moment, is carried by coal mm -hmm. um, and uh, nuclear. Um, natural gas is used a lot more these days to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And as we move forward to decarbonizing and removing coal from the equation, I think people will be looking for more natural gas to fill the gaps left by coal. Right. Um, but ultimately, if we want to decarbonize, natural gas is also CO2 producing. So to fill that gap, uh, what are the options to fill that gap with zero carbon emissions? There are really only two at the moment. All right? um, one is conventional nuclear. Right. If we can uh, keep the price down and we can get the public acceptance of, nu of conventional nuclear. Um, Nobody's quite sure if that's possible, right? Um, and the second is to burn fossil fuels and bury the carbon. Carbon capture. Carbon capture. And if you look at something like the Princeton Net Zero Project, mm -hmm. which looks at how you might construct an energy system that has no CO2 emissions, uh, those two options are the how you get your base load. Okay. Um, and so the problem is, you know, the acceptability of a large amount of, of conventional nuclear is, is not clear. And the second is, how long do you want to bury CO2 in the ground? I see it personally as a transition technology. It's a, it's a way to get from A to B, but over decades it's probably not a, a good solution. Right, because you're putting an awful lot of liquidized CO2 under the ground. So uh, you mentioned solar and wind and how they currently provide carbon-free energy and that there's a lot of hope that they can take up a larger portion of our energy load going forward. But there's also a lot of concern about the amount of land that both solar and wind could take if indeed we were going to depend on it for much more. 
Could you see fusion actually coming in later in the century and allowing us to then reuse that land for agriculture and other things? Could it be something that would replace renewables as well? Oh, I think that's probably true. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think at the moment um, the cost of wind is sufficiently low, particularly wind, but in places like California and Arizona, solar too, um, that it would be difficult to challenge it for some decades. Um, I, I also think that the ability, you know, the ability to have your energy when you need it and not sort of when the wind blows is a major advantage. And the way we cost their sources at the moment is we don't cost those peripheral things that come with it, like when you put in wind, you have to put in something that will, you'll be able to turn on when the wind doesn't blow. Or battery storage. Or, or battery storage, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, Fusion gets around all of those problems because it will be addressable. On the, at the moment you need the energy, you can turn on the energy, and the moment you don't need the energy, you can turn it off. Um, that will make a big difference. So how easy will it be to integrate into our grid? I've read fantastic stories of how small ones could potentially be on container ships or they could be put into fossil fuel plants um, that are already attached to the grid. Is it that flexible or are those indeed the pipe dreams? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, one of the big advantages of fusion is, is its safety. It doesn't have the possibility of a runaway reaction. And that's critical, which means that we can put fusion power stations next to houses. Mm. We can put fusion power stations next to cities. This is a big help because, of course, most of our energy goes to those large places and big industrial centers. And uh, it means that we can replace uh, you know, coal-fired power stations directly with fusion power stations. A lot of coal-fired power stations are next to cities, they're in industrial areas, um, and uh, fusion would fit right into that slot. Right? That's very helpful because, of course, the grid is built around those slots. Right. Our distribution is built around those slots. And so in terms of what would a utility boss want to buy, you most want to buy something that would fit exactly into the slot of the one you're retiring, and the fusion can do that. So you mentioned earlier about the fact that the White House has come out very strongly in support of pursuing this new technology. Is this something that has bipartisan support if we have a new administration coming yeah. in? Do you expect that Fusion will continue to be supported? And then a secondary question is, is this a technology that we can lead in and be the leaders in the world, or is it something that, like many other new technologies, we are playing catch up? Um. First of all, it's clearly very bipartisan. There's a fusion caucus in, in Congress, and this is a new thing, and we are, uh, and the fusion caucus has people from both sides of the house. Um, very strong support in the previous administration, actually was growing support in the previous administration under the previous Secretary of Energy and the Under Secretary Paul DeBar was a huge supporter of growing the fusion program, and he's he was very helpful moving into this. So I don't see it as a partisan issue at all. Um, uh, this administration uh, has come on board very strongly on this because I think there's a th this growing realization that we need something like fusion, if not fusion itself. Uh, to fill a hole in the in, in the mid-century market, and while everybody agrees that one day we'll have fusion, this administration is saying we need it faster than you could possibly think. Hmm. Right, so we need we need to get going very fast. We're expecting it to come as public-private partnerships, almost entirely. I think we've all been impressed how that's worked in in uh, the space industry. Mm -hmm. has brought down the costs of launches and, and putting satellites into orbit and we all know SpaceX and uh, these new space companies and I think um, you know people like me um, are not experts in how to get something to market that will be really commercially 
competitive. So that melding of private and public, I think, is going to be critical to the delivery of this. And we see that in the current administration, and I think it would resonate with any future uh, party. I, don't, I think it would resonate with a Republican administration, too. So I can see that very strongly. Um, oh, sorry, what was the other part of that well, question? Well, how do we fit into uh, the international activities that are going? Are we leading? Are we following? Are we creating the partnerships there that will enable us to get where we need to go? So this is interesting, actually. Um, in this area, American science has led. Right. I, in my view, and I'm British, so I have a somewhat unbiased view, although I'm running an American lab, um, I think the, the science has largely been led by the Americans. Some good work in Europe, Britain, Japan, and now a growing amount of work in China. Um, and historically, of course, the Russians had a very strong program, but that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, we can't afford not to do this. I said at the White House summit, I'm not sure if it's a very good quote, but um, I said, look, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. And if this is going to be, let's say, 30% of the world energy market, the world energy market is seven, eight trillion a year. Mm -hmm. right? It's a huge market. It's vast. And uh, you want to pass up 30% of that market? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right? Somebody, and the thing about fusion is it, it depends on what you know how to do, not what's under your ground or what resources you have. It's very technology dependent, right? And the people who are going to dominate that market are the people with the highest tech and, and the best version of a fusion reactor. And the US should aim to be that. Right. We have that capability, we have the science, we need to deliver that technology. Just as, you know, we currently dominate the electric car market. Right? Why does the US dominate that? Because the US system of innovation is, in my opinion, the best in the world. We drive things into the market faster than almost faster than anybody in the world. Right? We may not be so good when those technologies get very mature. I always said this was true about Britain, and I think it's also true about America. We get bored, you know, <laughs> delivering the same old thing, the same old thing. But I always remember when I was a student, and I've been in fusion the whole time, um, we worried about Japan. Right? This is the 1980s, right? In the 1980s, we worried about Japan. They were going to swallow us. Their capability of producing cars and ships and things like the, the, the technologies of then it was, uh, it seemed to be dominating us and, and swallowing us up. And yet they didn't. And why didn't they? We, because actually those weren't the technologies of tomorrow. Right? The technologies of tomorrow were Microsoft, they were Google, they were, you know, all the information technologies that grew up in that period from the late 80s to the, you know, to, to 2000. Um, Fusion's one of those technologies now, right? It, whoever dominates the technology of fusion dominates the energy market of the future, right? So you cannot afford not to be in it. So Steve, you have given me a lot of hope here today because I have heard so much about fusion and it seems like it is within reach if we decide to do the investment and do the hard work of making it and, and have smart scientists like you making the magic happen. Does it give you hope for future generations and that we can meet this challenge of climate change? We can meet this challenge of climate change. This will be one of the tools in it. My guess is that as time goes on, as we know how to do fusion better and better, it may become a bigger and bigger fraction of the energy market because it is very compact. It is easy to put where you need it. It is easy to turn on when you... And so I see this is an evolving challenge. You know, the, the challenge of getting as much carbon out of the energy system as possible is something we should address right now. Right? We should be getting as much wind and solar in onto the grid as we can get, right? Um, <coughs> and reducing coal, 
all, all the, those things. But to make a truly sustainable energy source, I think we're going to need fusion. And uh, what I'm so excited about, you know, the White House initiative, is that this is going to mean a real stimulus to build the first set of electricity producing fusion reactors. The time scale for that, somewhere in the 2030s. And I'm, I'm going to be around in the 2030s, <laughs> and I'm going to see those first electricity producing reactors. And I think once we can show that you can produce electricity, then the market will just, will just run towards it. Wonderful. Well, this has been so interesting and uplifting. And thank you for spending this last 45 minutes with us, explaining to us about the potential of fusion. I'm sorry to shut the conversation off. And for our audience, I'd like to remind you that this is Sir Stephen Cowley, a world-renowned expert on fusion energy and currently the director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. We certainly appreciate the fact that you spent this time with us. We look forward to sharing further interviews with you as well. In the meantime, please look to our website, seachangeconversations.org, for more information about climate, including our monthly newsletter that curates news of hope and news of concern in this climate arena. In addition, follow us on social media for information about climate change and things that are happening in our world today. Hope to see you next time. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you.